Okay, good morning. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to the Conference on Afghanistan and the region, Security, Stability, and Prosperity. Um, it's a real pleasure to have all of you here. Um, uh, my name is Sanjay Puri. I'm the chairman of the U.S.-India Political Action Committee. Uh, we are a political organization that really represents the Indian American community, three million Indian Americans in this country. And uh, it's an honor to host this conference with two great partners, FIDS and the American Foreign Policy Council. And um, I think we have a fantastic group of uh, speakers for you today. So we want to just lay out a few logistical perspectives to make sure that um, the conference kind of moves at the pace as we like it to move. Uh, we have allocated about 15 minutes um, with a few exceptions uh, for the speakers. Um, and then we'll have Q&A that will be moderated. A um, couple of just logistical standpoints, please. Uh, uh, if you can turn off your cell phones or please put them on uh, mute uh, just uh, because it's really rude to the speakers. And uh, also do not have sidebar conversations during um, you know, uh, the speeches or even during the Q&A. And if, while you're having questions, uh, just don't be too selfish because we want to give everybody a chance. Um, you know, Afghanistan uh, is an important topic. Uh, the United States is going to be withdrawing its uh, troops in 2014. And Americans are really focused on the withdrawal. But there is a question of what happens to Afghanistan um, in the future. Uh, the peace, the prosperity, as you will hear from uh, a lot of our speakers, is dependent on a lot of different factors, that's including U.S., but also the regional players. There is no peace and prosperity for Afghanistan if all the regional players are not engaged, according in our view. And hopefully, all of you are experts, think tanks, staffers. Uh, uh, here, you'll take some perspectives. You'll engage in a dialogue in that perspective. We have three different panels. Uh, the panels are management and transition and ensuring stability. Then there's a keynote session. And then we have a moderate and balanced Afghanistan. Um, and we have different speakers. And we have a lunch, uh, which will be a working lunch. And we'll be providing that to you. And there's water outside um, for that. Uh, without getting into too much delay, I'm going to invite our partner, Mr. Khanderao, to start the moderation of the first panel. Uh, Mr. Khanderao. So welcome uh, everybody. Um, I am uh, director of uh, uh, FEEDS, which is a foundation for India and Indian diaspora studies, uh, which is a new and young uh, think tank, uh, particularly focusing on uh, India-related issue and Indian-related issues all over the world. Uh, we facilitate exchange between experts on Indian subcontinent, subcontinent and experts from Indian subcontinent. So that's a dialogues. We also, a charter is to provide the authentic, well-researched information on the facts, events, and policies matters related to India and uh, Indian diasporas. Uh, quickly, I would introduce uh, our three great uh, panelists uh, who are here today. Uh, Michael O'Hanlon, uh, who is a, a senior fellow uh, from uh, uh, Brookings Institute. Uh, he is a, a Center for 21st Century uh, and Intelligence uh, Director of Research for the Foreign Policy Programs. Uh, he also teaches at John Hopkins University, then uh, Princeton. Uh, he has a great uh, 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 experience on these uh, issues. Particularly, he has recently brought a book on Afghanistan, uh, get, uh, toughing it out in Afghanistan. Uh, it's his uh, recent work on this one. Also, he is a co-author of uh, Afghanistan Index from Brookings uh, Institute. Uh, many books uh, are on his name. Uh, some of the new books are on the this uh, um, uh, healing the wounded giant. Uh, it is related to the this uh, media uh, the military expenditures. Uh, so we have good to have Michael on the board. We have Lisa uh, Curtis. And uh, Lisa, all, all of us know that uh, she uh, uh, has a background from uh, diplomacy, 
uh, to the uh, journalism and also the expert on the think tank. She is a well sought uh, expert on the various uh, media channels. Uh, she is uh, from the Heritage uh, Foundation. Uh, she has been testified uh, to Congress uh, many times. She has been also uh, advisor to White House uh, uh, in the, during the 2002-2003 time frame. Uh, she has a very first-hand experience in uh, Indian subcontinent. Uh, particularly, she served uh, uh, the Pakistan and India in the uh, mission over there in mid-1990s. So I welcome uh, Lisa Curtis uh, on panel. And uh, we have our third distinguished uh, speaker. Uh, who is coming all the way from India, but at the same time, he is not uh, new to uh, many of us. Uh, he is uh, Dr. Kanwal Sibal. Dr. Kanwal Sibal uh, was actually uh, here as a DCM in the uh, 90s. Uh, very old, I think elderly people may know that uh, he was uh, representing Indian uh, mission over here. But uh, the most importantly, he has been India's uh, foreign secretary, and uh, he has a great uh, uh, the, uh, knowledge about uh, the issues related to subcontinent. Uh, he is actively involved into diplomatic and uh, international affairs, uh, particularly related to the Indian uh, subcontinent. He is also the first grand doctor of philosophy in India. So he is also that way intellectual and he has a great degree of publication on his names. So I welcome uh, Dr. Kanwal Sibal on the panel. Uh, so. So this uh, panel is uh, uh, very important from uh, how to go uh, forward because we all know that uh, uh, 2014 by December there will be withdrawal of the troops and there are great degree of uh, concerns about that how that transition is going to happen and how would be the uh, stability. So this panel is mo mostly delving into that uh, the transitional aspect, the managing uh, the transition as well as ensuring uh, the stability. So that's the discussion of the panel. We are expecting Congressman uh, Elliot uh, uh, Engel uh, to initiate uh, uh, this session, uh, not just the session, but the conference. Uh, but uh, he is uh, stuck a little bit on the way. Uh, he will be here any minute. So that's why we first thought that we'll do the introduction part of it. And uh, we are also having uh, Congressman Joe Crowley. Uh, both of them are going to be here. When they come, I will briefly introduce, but uh, for benefit of others, I will first uh, do the, the introductions. I'm sure that they have heard their introduction quite a few times, so it, it will not be fun to hear from me. So let me start from uh, uh, Elliot. Uh, so uh, yeah, he's a, a ranking member of uh, on a foreign committee, so which is a very important uh, and. Uh, uh, he has been uh, from uh, bronze uh, uh, democrat from the uh, new york uh, area uh, his uh, uh, political uh, career has been very distinguished and his focus on various aspects which are pertaining to very important to american uh, citizens but uh, mainly like affordable housing real estate healthcare education for all americans these are the in uh, topics of the common interest but he is not just the focusing on the domestic issues but also on the international uh, aspects uh, mainly security and the energy sustainability is his uh, area of uh, focus and uh, one of the most important uh, contribution that uh, uh, we see from uh, congressman uh, elliot so congressman engel is also author of syria accountability and uh, lebanese sovereignty restoration act of 2003 and uh, which this particular act has been, has been very uh, instrumental in putting the pressure uh, to get uh, the Syria out of the Lebanese. So that is the, in the international setting, he has a great degree of uh, influence. Uh, similarly, uh, particularly the child laborers and enslavement happening in the, the African uh, region. So he had been working uh, towards uh, uh, that. So I would like to welcome uh, Congressman uh, to uh, initiate uh, this great conference. Good morning, everybody, and thank you uh, very, very much. It's really an honor to be here. Um, I'm now the ranking member of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, I've been in Congress for 25 years, 
and I think it was that when I was in Congress for my second or third year, a group of us got together and formed the India Caucus, and I was an original member of that caucus and have been a proud member all these years I've been in Congress. Uh, I've always felt that the United States and India uh, had so much in common, uh, with, with India, of course, being the world's largest democracy and the United States being the world's oldest democracy. And um, it always made sense to me that the outlook of the U.S. and India ha has always been very, very uh, similar. And uh, I have always been a strong supporter of closer uh, U.S.-India uh, ties. I'm, I'm glad we seem to be moving in that direction. In many ways, we're already there. But of course, there's always things to keep doing. So I am very, very honored uh, to be here. Um, I want to begin by thanking the U.S. India Political Action Committee and uh, Sanjay for hosting today's event uh, and for all the work that you've done over the past 10 years to increase Indian American participation in the American political process. You know, at a time when this um, Congress, the Senate, are uh, debating uh, immigration issues, uh, it always kind of irks me a bit when people talk about immigrants as if somehow or other they're coming to this country and the question is, um, what are they going to do? Is it bad? Is it good? Is it a little bit in between? So on and so forth. And um, I always like to remind people that unless uh, you uh, are an American Indian or a descendant of an American Indian, all of us are actually immigrants or, or the sons and daughters and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of immigrants. My uh, own grandparents came to this country 100 years ago uh, from Eastern Europe, um, seeking the same things that so many uh, people have, have sought from this great country. And uh, I think one only has to look at the Indian American community and the, the wonderful um, not only strides that, that it's made, uh, but the fact, you know, I have a, 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 in my district a special school in, in New York City called the Bronx High School of Science. It's really world uh, renowned. It's a public school, but a lot of people uh, go there. Very uh, top uh, tests, admission tests to go there. And when you take a look at the student body today, there's a huge percentage of Indian American students uh, that have made this test a uh, competitive test. I have to tell you, it's one of the hardest tests to, uh, to pass. And so again, it's a, it's, it's a testimony, a testament to the American um, Indian community, Indian American community, and um, a testament to uh, the fact that um, we're all children of immigrants. I think that's very, very important. So um, I want to recognize a few people. Some I, uh, are not here yet, but um, uh, Rujnath, Rajnath, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, Singh, the president, and uh, the former Indian Foreign Secretary, Kanwal Sebal, former head of India's Intelligence Bureau, Ajit Doval, and Amrula Sala, the former head of Afghanistan's National uh, Security. It's a pleasure to welcome you uh, to the United States Congress. Um, you know, there's a transformation that's occurred, as I said before, of U.S.-Indian relations. When we established the India Caucus, there were more irritants than areas of agreement. That's not the case now. Uh, what was once of our uh, big stumbling blocks, the nuclear issue, has been transformed into one of our relationship's biggest successes and a central pillar of the U.S.-India strategic uh, partnership. Uh, trade in goods between our two countries has increased from a modest $5.6 billion, that's not so modest, but it's modest for two big countries, in 1990 to $62.9 uh, billion in 2012. That's just phenomenal. Uh, more than 1,000% growth in a span of 22 years, and it's unthinkable 20 years ago, now India does more defense exercises with the United States than with any other country in the world and our people-to-people -people ties are second to none, and you are all a very important, obviously, part of those people-to-people -people ties. Engagement between our two countries in, is broader than it has ever been, from homeland security and counterterrorism to clean energy and human rights. India has become an important economic, political, and security partner, including in Afghanistan. And, and let, me, uh, let me just say, both India and the United States uh, have suffered uh, terrorist attacks, and both India and the United States uh, understand what the scourge uh, of terrorism is. And I had the, um, the great honor, uh, back in 1997, of being in the parliament in Delhi uh, at the exact 50th anniversary of independence uh, for India at midnight. They had a, a gong when the clock reached midnight. We were all sitting in Parliament, and that was the 50th anniversary at that time 
of uh, India's independence, and it was an honor for me to be there. Um, as you know, uh, 2013 and 2014 marks a uh, transformative point for U.S. involvement in Afghanistan. Just last month, Afghan security forces assume responsibility for security nationwide, and this handover of responsibility was a significant milestone for the war and makes a clear turning point for American and ISAF forces who will now move into a supporting role as 2014 draws down. I know much has been said about U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, but I want to reassure you that this is not the end of U.S. engagement in Afghanistan or the region. And that's why the Obama administration in May of, this, of 2012 completed negotiations on a strategic partnership with Afghanistan that outlines the course of our engagement in Afghanistan beyond 2014 in areas such as regional security, democracy and governance, and economic and social development. And through this agreement, the U.S. formalized an enduring partnership with Afghanistan that strengthens Afghan sovereignty, stability, and prosperity, and that contributes to our shared goal, and I said this before, of defeating al-Qaeda and its extremist affiliates. At the same time, we know that conflict in Afghanistan will not come to an end via a decisive military victory. While the fighting continues, the pursuit of stability there must involve negotiation as well. There are those, and I'm one of them, who question whether the Taliban have a sincere desire to talk and work with the Afghan government. Ultimately, however, I recognize that there must be a negotiated political reconciliation for stability to take hold, and in my opinion, it should be a reconciliation that not only satisfies the government in Kabul and the Taliban, but one that is acceptable to all Afghans. It is important that we, Afghanistan's neighbors, and the international community support this process. Now, as part of the re reconciliation process, it's important that the U.S. enforce the established red lines with the Taliban before engaging in a full-fledged dialogue. We must protect the gains we've made on counterterrorism, women's rights, and counter-narcotics over the past decade. Naturally, the security transition and reconciliation process gone as much of the media spotlight, but the political trans transition will be a key component to Afghanistan stability past 2014. I'm encouraged by some of the steps occurring in Kabul to ensure that next year's presidential election is not just acceptable but meets the necessary standard for electoral credibility. I welcome President Karzai signing the law governing the Election Commission and another outlining how the vote will be held. When the election is completed and a new president replaces Mr. Karzai, it will be the first time that the Afghanistan uh, people have had a peaceful transfer of power. And it will send a much needed signal about the sustainability of Afghan democracy. But none of this can happen without continued support from Afghanistan's neighbors. And this is where we look to India to play an important role. In the aftermath of the U.S. intervention in 2001, some in the U.S. viewed the Indian presence in Afghanistan as an irritant that complicated efforts to enhance stability, primarily due to the concerns it generated in Pakistan. A decade later, there's a consensus that India is and will be a key partner in bringing and maintaining stability in Afghanistan. India has provided more than $2 billion in developmental assistance to Afghanistan since 2002. India is, by a considerable margin, the largest regional donor and the sixth largest bilateral donor to Afghan reconstruction. Indian assistance has contributed to Afghanistan's infrastructure, including highways and hospitals and rural electricity projects. It is also helping the Afghan government rebuild its police force, judiciary and diplomatic services as well. And a consortium of Indian companies has begun participating in Afghanistan's extractive industry in what I hope can be a model for others on how to best help Afghanistan benefit from its natural resource wealth while avoiding the resource curse that has plagued many developing countries. Regrettably, uh, India's positive efforts in Afghanistan will generate sus intense suspicion in Pakistan, in Islamabad, where fears remain that India is trying to encircle its neighbor. I understand the long and difficult history between India and Pakistan, but I think these views are outdated. 
and I hope they soon become outdated in Pakistan as well. And again, when I was in India's parliament in, in, uh, in 1997, at that 50th anniversary, we contrasted the difference that has happened, the history between India and Pakistan uh, during the course of independence for both countries in, in 1947, the difference, whereas Pakistan has had many different military coups, India has had a stable uh, democratic uh, government. For far too long, the international community has turned a blind eye to Pakistani attempts to balance its fear of India by supporting the Taliban insurgency in Afghanistan. After decades of supporting this approach, some argue that Pakistan, now facing an insurgency on its own territory, has made a strategic shift. Greater instability in Afghanistan, the theory goes, will only mean greater instability in Pakistan after NATO troops withdraw from Afghanistan in 2014. If this shift is real, then it could have major implications for stability in Afghanistan past 2014. But only time will tell if Pakistan is ready to change course. I hope they are. I hope they will. I think the United States should support them. We have an enormous stake uh, in the region, and we need friendly relations with all countries. So ultimately, no transition in Afghanistan, military or political, will be successful unless those forces seeking to destabilize Afghanistan play a constructive role in allowing Afghans to determine the future of Afghanistan for themselves. Uh, again, uh, I very much welcome the close relationship between the U.S. and India. I'm working every day to make that relationship closer, and I think that our, our two uh, great countries have so much in common. You know, I o often look at uh, relations between countries as almost like a family. If you're married, you know that some days you don't want to even talk to your spouse, and some days you do. Uh, same thing with your kids. Um, but you know what? You're all one family, and you realize that it is important that what binds you and, and, and the love of each other is so much um, greater than what divides you. I, I look at India and the United States a, as a family. I think there is much, much more in common uh, than the things, the irritants uh, that may uh, disrupt uh, some of the things. So I will look, uh, continue to uh, be an active member of the India Caucus, continue to work uh, very closely uh, with my friends. And on the Foreign Affairs Committee, I can assure you uh, there is bipartisan support for the U.S.-India relationship. And as I mentioned in my remarks, the United States is very grateful for the positive and construction, constructive role that India has played in Afghanistan. So thank you very, very much. Have a great conference. So thanks a lot for uh, Congressman uh, Elliot uh, Engel to eloquently cover uh, the positions and also the complicated uh, uh, issue uh, related to the uh, transition. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Michael uh, to uh, the, uh, the uh, panel to uh, speak over here. Uh, what we are going to do is that uh, each of the panelists are going to speak uh, 10 to 15 minutes, so 15 minutes, and then uh, we will not have questions immediately. The question and answer sessions would be after, so uh, you can direct the questions. Uh, if there are too many questions, of course, then we will have to moderate the questions and select that. One request we'll request is that uh, the question should be the question, and question should not be the, the dictation of the po your positions. So just we can be brief, and then that would be very good. So I welcome Mike. Thank you and good morning. It's an honor to be here. I'll try to make a few brief remarks because I know we are going to have a fun discussion and there are a lot of uh, ideas and questions on your mind and I think that'll be really the most uh, redeeming part. But let me begin with just a few observations and with some of them tailored more towards an India-America community, some of them more general about Afghanistan. And I'm going to go again fairly quickly because I think we're all tracking this issue and I just want to drive home a couple of points. First of all, a couple of reasons why I'm still hopeful about Afghanistan. Uh, one of them is, even though the Afghan security forces continue to take enormous casualties, and we've seen discussion of this again in today's New York Times and elsewhere, they are indeed fighting hard for their country. And that's, in fact, part of the reason they're taking such high casualties. We have seen the transition from lead control in all of the country now handed off to the ANSF, as was mentioned earlier. 
And I think this is a very important milestone. It does not yet mean the Afghan forces are fully independent. It does not yet mean they can make do on their own. And I'm going to come back to the so-called zero option uh, in just a second. I'm strongly against that. But the Afghan security forces are now leading about 90 percent of all operations in their country. And they're in control, whatever that means. But admittedly, it's a somewhat vague and flexible concept. But they're in primary control of the entire territory of the state. They've been showing for years they can do pretty well in places like Kabul, where they've actually been in lead uh, operations now for a number of years. So one thing we have to hold on to and be hopeful about is the strength of the Afghan security forces. I'm not saying they can defeat the Taliban. After all, the greatest alliance and greatest community of nations in history, the international community as currently deployed in Afghanistan, has not been able to defeat the Taliban. The Taliban is unfortunately a very resilient enemy, and unfortunately Pakistan in particular has been a little bit too tolerant of the Taliban. So we're not going to be able to expect the Afghan security forces to defeat the Taliban. But I do believe that we can hope that most of the populated areas and main road arteries, main economic corridors of Afghanistan can remain generally under government control, especially if we can execute a gradual ongoing handoff of responsibility to the Afghan forces and if next year's presidential election in Afghanistan goes well. So let me now say a brief word about that. This is a very, very important event, and I think everyone knows this. If there were to be a bad outcome, either an um, extended delay in the election or a fraudulent election or the election of a blatantly incompetent or corrupt leader or a divisive election that pitted one group of Afghans against another and led to uh, growing civil tension and perhaps civil war, none of these things would be compatible with our current hopes for Afghanistan. None of these would be compatible with the international community's willingness to continue to support Afghanistan with generous aid and security assistance. So we need to work hard on this election together. And I, am, I do have some concerns. When I was last in Afghanistan, which was in March, I sensed overall that there was an, a reluctance on the part of the international community, broadly defined, including not just the United States, but other countries, uh, including the United Nations mission, uh, a, a reluctance to get very involved in the Afghan election. This was partly a reflection of the pain and scarring that occurred in 2009 and 2010, when we had such extensive and um, frustrating and painful exchanges between Ambassador Holbrook and President Karzai, uh, Peter Galbraith working at the UN and Ambassador Karzai, uh, some members of the White House staff and President Karzai about the elections. Uh, we felt that there had not been enough integrity to the election. Karzai felt that we were trying to deny him a clearly legitimate victory that even if you allowed for all the irregularities in the vote would still have produced a clear mandate for him. So both sides felt the well had been poisoned. We better not go down that path again. But if we totally pull back and we don't give our Afghan friends help in certain areas, and I hope we can come back to this in the discussion. I've got a few ideas on what those might be. I'll just mention one in a second. But if we don't help, I have some concerns and doubts as to whether the Afghans can really have a good election and whether there's a chance that President Karzai, as much as I respect what he's done for his country, may wind up a little too tempted to try to orchestrate a certain outcome. Again, I think he generally wants to do uh, what's right, but he also worries about his own survival, about his own legacy, and about trying to perhaps orchestrate uh, a certain kind of outcome. And some of that's okay. Incumbents in this country and in India try to influence uh, who will succeed them at one level. But you have to do it above board, transparently, and by the rules. So I think, for example, one of the things we all need to help the Afghan people do, and the very impressive and competent Afghan reform community, the young people, the uh, uh, diaspora of Afghans, many of whom have come back, the very good Afghan people who are committed to their country's future. We have to help them monitor the campaign as it begins to heat up this fall to make sure that the media are covering all different candidates equally that there is not uh, an exclusive focus by state media on the preferred uh, ticket of whatever preferred ticket may emerge uh, out of consultations in the coming months. And I think we have to also help Afghan political parties strengthen themselves, because the parties are too weak in Afghanistan. And as a result, if you don't have parties, all you have left are personalities and, per and patronage networks and tribal communities. Parties are better 
than any of those alternatives for organizing political debate and discourse. I think internationally we've made a mistake at trying to keep Afghan political parties weak, going along with the idea that somehow because parties had had a bad history uh, in the Communist Party and other, uh, other organized entities in the past in Afghanistan, that we better not encourage or allow the development of strong parties in the future. That may have been may or may not have been correct for a moment a decade ago, it's no longer correct. And I think those of us who come from established democracies, like Indians and Americans, need to help Afghan parties, not with any choice of one group over another, and obviously we all know there are sensitivities. Indians can be blamed for helping the Northern Alliance too much. Americans can be blamed for helping anybody who's against Karzai too much. We all know the way in which we can make mistakes or be seen as trying to serve our own agendas, so we have to be careful about how we do this, and we have to do it through a broad international effort. But I think we have to try. We have to take a couple of risks on behalf of helping Afghan reformers and Afghan Democrats, because this election is too crucial. Just a couple more words and I'll be done. First, let me say something about the zero option. This has emerged in the last few weeks in the United States, again, in the newspapers, as an idea that the White House was apparently willing to countenance. Uh, I'm hopeful that this is not a serious American preferred option. General Dempsey suggested yesterday in Kabul that it was not. Uh, but the White House has sometimes, I think, felt frustrated with President Karzai to the point of not wanting him to feel that he had carte blanche uh, or that there was, was some guarantee the United States and the international community would stay with uh, forces in Afghanistan beyond next year. And so sometimes we've sort of pushed back. And this zero option has gotten a little bit of credence. Uh, and we've allowed it to, partly in order to make President Karzai feel that he's not going to be able to just play us like a little puppet, because sometimes he seems to think that the United States and others are so desperate to keep foreign bases in Afghanistan beyond next year that we will basically accept any kind of conditions or terms that he is willing to impose. That's not good strategic analysis on his part. The reason we want to be in Afghanistan after next year with 10 or 15,000 forces is to help Afghanistan and to keep an eye on terrorists just over the border. Those are the exclusive two reasons. Unfortunately, it's very hard to persuade President Karzai of that, and that's why the White House and the palace get into these tiffs, and that's why the White House allows this zero option idea to be floated. I think it's a bad idea even to float it. I think we should, as General Allen and Michelle Flournoy and I wrote two months ago in a paper that we produced uh, through CNAS, the United States should be clear, the international community should be clear. If we get reasonable status of forces agreement uh, provisions, we should want to stay in Afghanistan, and we should say that now. We should be unambiguous, and it would be preferable even to give a rough number of how many forces we'd be willing to keep. But we can also make it clear that if those conditions aren't met, if we don't get acceptable status of forces agreement offers, or if we don't see a reasonable election process next year, then of course all bets are off. I think just being clear about those views would actually be helpful. I think it would help reassure Afghans and maybe even reassure some Pakistanis, some of whom at least, I believe, are willing to partially rethink what has been their strategy until now, which is essentially playing both sides of the fence. And we've got to try to get Pakistanis to go more in the direction of at least believing in the Afghan project uh, and distancing themselves from the Taliban if we're going to have long-term hope on this. And so one final word, and then I will be done, uh, which is simply to say that I think uh, after so much that's been invested, after so much that's been uh, sacrificed, after all that we have done internationally, after all that our Afghan friends uh, have done so far, we should think about the moment of mid-2013 going into the elections next year, not as a time to cut our losses, but as a time to try to lock in our gains and make them more solid. There really have been a lot of gains in Afghanistan. It's a very hopeful environment in many different ways. And, and I think uh, we can, with relatively modest additional effort compared to what we've already done, find a way to help Afghans at least hold on to the measure of stability they've got now. I'm not predicting an end to the insurgency writ large. I'm not predicting, of course, uh, a completely uh, clean and, and uh, perfect election process. But I do think we can continue to see incremental progress building on the remarkable headway the Afghan people have managed to make in the last 10 or 12 years. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Michael has given very clearly an uh, optimistic view, at least give it a try, and uh, uh, make cautious efforts to have some safeguards. Uh, let's hear from Lisa. OK, 
Okay, thank you very much to uh, Mr. Sanjay Puri and US Impact and FIIDS for inviting me here today and for you all taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to be here. So the key to a successful transition in Afghanistan, I believe, is U.S. commitment to sustaining the gains that have already been made in the country and to ensuring that the Taliban do not again become the predominant power in the country. So in short, the U.S. must not repeat the same mistake it made nearly 20 years ago when it disengaged abruptly from Afghanistan. And we especially shouldn't do that when we've invested so much blood and treasure into the country over the last 11 years. And there is a genuine risk of the Taliban reestablishing its power base and facilitating the revival of al-Qaeda if the U.S. does not handle this transition carefully and responsibly. And that is why, even though U.S. officials are extremely frustrated with Karzai, we should not allow this frustration to cause a troop uh, drawdown to turn into a rush for the exits that would certainly lead to chaos in the country and, of course, jeopardize U.S. national security interests, making us more vulnerable to terrorist threats. So, as Michael mentioned, there's been a great deal of discussion about the number of troops that will be left in Afghanistan post-2014. And it's my opinion, and I think uh, of many observers, uh, including Michael, that he just spelled out, that there should be a fairly robust presence left in the country. And we have heard from the former CENTCOM commander, General James Mattis, who made clear in remarks to Congress just a couple of months ago that he would like to see about 13,500 U.S. troops remain, and about half that amount, or 6,500 NATO troops from the other uh, countries remain, leaving about 20,000 international troops in Afghanistan post-2014 for training, advising, and counterterrorism missions. And I believe if the U.S. still has some 30,000 troops in Korea, nearly 60 years after the Korean War, surely we can find the resources and wherewithal to leave a substantial troop presence in Afghanistan, the country where the 9-11 attacks originated. So unfortunately, as Michael mentioned, we had this mention of the zero troop option being on the table. Um, and I also believe this is not a good, if, if this was a negotiating tactic, I don't think it is an effective one. And that's because the Afghans already believe that we're going to cut and run. So we, by putting this option out there, we just sort of play into their worst fears and we fuel this hedging behavior that has become so unhelpful to establishing uh, a strong partnership. And you know, the, the zero option is the Taliban dream option. Uh, an abrupt pull down in forces, of course, would allow the Taliban to more quickly regain influence, and obviously it would cripple our ability to be able to conduct counterterrorism missions after 2014, which will still be necessary. So this zero troop option came up because of the frustration uh, over the opening of the Taliban office in Doha a few weeks ago. And I think the U.S. administration blundered this situation. Uh, it, it looked as if they had sent a delegation, rushed a delegation to Doha to meet with the Taliban separately without the presence of the Afghan government. And it seemed to be playing into the hands of the Taliban whose you know, long sought objective is to cut the Karzai administration out of these talks. And the second problem was the Taliban scored a public relations victory. They raised their flag, the flag that uh, represented their five year rule in Afghanistan in the late 90s. And this all you know, frustrated Karzai badly and forced him to pull out of the bilateral security agreement talks. Uh, thus fulfilling another Taliban goal, which is to drive a wedge between the U.S. and Afghan governments. So I think Karzai's uh, frustration with the U.S. Uh, looking as if it's talking unilaterally to the Taliban is understandable. However, his decision to pull out of the uh, security talk certainly uh, was not beneficial, and I think it's like him cutting off his nose to spite his face. He himself knows that maintaining an international troop presence in Afghanistan post-2014 is essential to the stability of the Afghanistan state. Uh, would you like me? Are you sure? Okay. Um, 
<clears throat> so the Taliban has shown very little sign that it is ready to compromise for peace in Afghanistan. They appear to believe they are winning the war in Afghanistan and simply need to wait out U.S. and NATO forces. And their primary goals for engaging the U.S. appear to be simply releasing their prisoners and getting the U.S. to withdraw its troops more quickly. Uh, moreover, we have not seen any letdown in the violence, which would help prepare an environment conducive to talks. And in fact, in recent weeks, we've seen the Taliban uh, increase their attacks. Last month, for instance, insurgents conducted a suicide attack near the international airport, and two weeks later, they attacked the Afghan presidential palace. So all signs indicate that the Taliban is committed to violence and really has no real interest in participating in a peaceful political process. Now, this is not to say that the U.S. should not leave the door open for talks. Uh, it's merely to acknowledge that the chances for a peaceful political negotiation with the Taliban, uh, those chances are just very low at the moment. So aside from troop withdrawals in 2014, I think the most important event in Afghanistan will be the elections. Uh, this is an opportunity for a relatively peaceful democratic transition. Uh, the U.S. certainly should be providing technical support as well as regular statements indicating the importance of a fair and impartial process and demonstrate to the Afghans that the U.S. would not tolerate the cancellation or delay of the elections beyond April 2014. Now, ensuring women's participation in the, in the electoral process is also absolutely crucial. One of the key tools the Taliban use to instill fear in the Afghan population and consolidate their power base is the subjugation of women. They did this in the 1990s by forcing harsh rules on women, banning girls' education, banning women from working outside of the home, and even denying women access to health care. And there are few signs that they would do anything differently now. That is why it is so important to not lose the gains that have been made for women over the last 10 years. Now, it was heartening to see USAID's announcement last week of a $200 million assistance program over five years that will fund scholarships for women, invest in women-owned businesses, and promote the inclusion of women in civil service and elective office. So in talking about women and their role in Afghan, society. We are not merely dealing with a side issue of little consequence. The fate of women in Afghanistan, aside from being a human rights issue, will reflect the broader trends in the country and indeed the nature of the Afghan state, whether it will be a country that is stable and controls terrorists or whether it will be a safe haven for terrorists. Now let me just end with a few words about Pakistan. Um, I think the U.S. needs to determine whether Pakistan is willing to help stabilize Afghanistan or whether it will persist in pl playing a spoiler role. Uh, there continues to be close ties between the Pakistan military and, for instance, the Haqqani network that attacks coalition Afghan forces and Afghan civilians. So I think that we need to strengthen the conditions on our military aid and, in particular, target the coalition support funds. These are the funds that the U.S. Uh, reimburses the PAC military for having some 150,000 troops stationed along the border. But my point is, if those troops are not focusing on cracking down the most dangerous terrorist network in the region, then there's, there's little point uh, to having them there. So we've already provided about $10 billion in coalition support funds over the last decade to Pakistan, and it's time that we start conditioning those funds on Pakistan cracking down on the Haqqani network. And in fact, these provisions are contained in the fiscal year 2014 National Defense Authorization Act legislation. Uh, they're contained in the version that passed the House in early June, so the hope is that this language will stay in the bill. So just to recap, as difficult as the job may be, it is essential that the U.S. remained engaged in Afghanistan militarily, diplomatically, financially. Um, it would be short-sighted to ignore the perilous consequences of the U.S. turning its back on this pivotal country. Uh, and I think that with you know, perseverance and commitment to some of the goals that I have laid out, it is possible to achieve a measure of stability in Afghanistan that will 
help protect core U.S. national security interests. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Lisa. Lisa resonated uh, uh, views about uh, strong uh, views against uh, zero option policies and uh, also warning against uh, optimistic viewpoint uh, in engaging uh, the Taliban's uh, rather uh, the more force on the, the safeguarding having the robust uh, presence. These are the few things that uh, highlighted. We of course would like to uh, hear uh, from uh, Mr. Kanwalla Sibal, uh, but uh, before that, I would like to recognize uh, uh, Congressman Joe Crowley, and uh, thanks for uh, coming. Uh, He is a uh, voice of a Democratic Caucus. Uh, he is a fifth ranking in the uh, House and a great uh, background uh, in the uh, congressional uh, issues, mainly focusing uh, after the 9-11. Uh, he has personal uh, tragedy in that. That uh, inspired him to focus on the urban uh, securities and making the uh, uh, urban uh, uh, cities and the targets of the targets. Uh, his initiative has been helped into uh, uh, that respect and making us safer. So I would like to welcome uh, Congressman to address us. Thank you. It's good to be back at a U.S. Impact event. Uh, and uh, particularly, it's good to have two Irishmen here uh, talking on uh, India and Afghanistan. So that's, you know you're in a good place. Uh, and to see Mr. Saval again, uh, uh, I met him a number of years ago uh, in his capacity then. Uh, working in, within the Indian government as the foreign uh, uh, secretary. Um, and that was during my uh, previous time as the uh, co-chair of the Indian caucus. I once again am co-chair again uh, and very proud to be here this morning. Uh, I also uh, would not be here in a lot of respects if it were not for Sanjay Puri as well. He's been a great friend and ally throughout the years. and. I appreciate uh, always seeing him and all he's done to, to help me personally. Um, this uh, discussion you're having today on Afghanistan, Afghanistan that's moving forward is uh, timely and one that impacts not only uh, on America uh, but throughout the world itself. What the United States has always wanted is a peaceful, stable, democratic, and prosperous Afghanistan. I very much hope that that is still possible. At the end of the day, the Afghans want what so many of us want, and that is the chance to raise their children, make a living, get ahead, and simply live their lives. After all, by some counts, over 40% of the Afghanistan population are under 14 years of age. These are kids, and it's them we should be thinking about. But the fact is, with the United States for the most part leaving Afghanistan next year, there are a lot of questions that are still up in the air, including what the leadership in Afghanistan will look like and whether or not it can find peace and truly unite the country. This is all the more important because the United States never planned to stay in Afghanistan forever, nor should we. But there is one thing we should be able to agree on, Afghanistan should be for the Afghan people. Afghanistan is not a country that should be taken over by any other country. And it's not a country that should be taken over by any one political group. We all want to avoid a situation in which the Taliban controls Afghanistan and renews the war on women, as Lisa pointed out. So I'm very happy that this panel is taking place today to examine these and other issues. These are the kinds of informed debates that need to take place and to happen sooner rather than later. I know that my good friends in Congress, Elliot Engel, as well as Ami Berra, are both working very hard on these issues, especially in regards to the Afghanistan-Indian relationship. Ami has focused in particular on issues relating to India-Afghanistan relationship, and I was glad to discuss it with him after his recent trip to Kabul. Later today, I'm meeting with Rajna Singh, the president of the BJP, to discuss his country's views on Afghanistan, amongst other issues. I appreciate all the Indian guests who are here uh, and a part 
of this discussion in this group today. I'm interested in the situation in Afghanistan because of the impact on America, but I've also uh, closely followed the regional impact as well. I am, as I said before, I'm the co-chair of the India Caucus, and I am a, an incredible fan uh, of India and its people. My co-chair, Peter Roskam, and I are doing everything we can to advance the U.S.-India relationship. I'm pro-India, to put it simply. But we aren't considering options on Afghanistan for the sake of anyone except the people of Afghanistan. That is a view that I hope many of our other countries who are engaged will also consider as well. It is a view that I believe India has taken, and I just hope Afghanistan's other neighbors do so as well. We need to move past old mindsets of zero-sum games. India is doing a wonderful job of moving on. It's time for the whole region to do so as well. In the end, doing what is best for, Afghani for Afghanistan will not only benefit India, but it will benefit all of Afghan Afghanistan's neighbors as well. I just hope that we can get there. Uh, and I know there is a great deal of concern about uh, the leaving of U.S. troops in Afghanistan. I would also just point out um, that's where the focus ought to have been, in my opinion, uh, from the get-go. As was mentioned earlier, I lost a first cousin uh, as a result of the attack of 9-11. Uh, and I think there was universal support for rooting out uh, uh, al-Qaeda and uh, their allies in the Taliban. And unfortunately, uh, we have not been as successful as I think we ought to have been uh, within the region. But I do think we have laid down uh, the fundamental uh, groundwork uh, for, for helping Afghanistan move towards a democratic state. Whether that is sustainable or not is up to the Afghanistan people. And it's my hope and I pray that they do find a way forward. Uh, it's in the interest, as I said before, not only of our country and of obviously Afghanistan, but the people of India and the surrounding communities as well as Pakistan as well. We need to get this right. Afghanistan needs to get it right. And India and all the countries in the region need to help make sure that Afghanistan gets it right. So thank you once again for having me here today. And uh, I look forward to hearing uh, about the report from uh, your further discussion today. Unfortunately, I have to go on to another committee meeting now. So thank you all very, very much. Thanks, Congressman uh, Joe Crowley, for uh, giving uh, uh, his position. It's very important, and uh, it gives a natural segue. Uh, he has brought uh, uh, the interest and the important of the countries in the South Asia, particularly Pakistan and most importantly in India, in the mix. So I would like to, and this is kind of a, gives a natural segue to Dr. Sukhanwal Siebel to welcome and give his perspective. Well, thank you for inviting me to this seminar on Afghanistan. You heard uh, um, the views from the American side. Now let me can share with you what we think. Uh, 2014 uh, will be a turning point in Afghanistan, as we all know. Uh, power will be handed over to a new president uh, after elections. The U.S. military will complete its withdrawal. The Afghan National Security Forces will take over the security responsibility for the country. The prospects for all these transitions uh, do not look promising. Uh, the new president will have to be a Pashtun in order to ensure broad-based ethnic support. Uh, president Karzai was parachuted to the presidency without elections in post-war circumstances in which the U.S. and the West could impose their will. But the U.S. and the West have not been able to manage Karzai. Uh, despite having many levers at their command. Can a new Pashtun leader emerge who can assure cross-ethnic support? Will he be able to deliver political stability and a degree of economic development in very difficult circumstances? I don't think there's any clear answer. The U.S. has signed a strategic partnership agreement with Washington, but the follow-up agreement, the bilateral security agreement, on the status of the residual U.S. forces in military bases remains to be finalized. Uh, the U.S. has failed to secure a suitable agreement in Iraq, 
if it fails in Afghanistan, uh, it is threatening a zero option, and we've heard some views on that. Whether this is pressure tactics or is a veritable option is not clear. In any case, the fact that this is being considered shows, at the very least, that the US has no clear answer for the future. I hope zero option does not mean zero answer. The ANSF may have numbers and reports that they are performing well, as we heard from Michael O'Hanlon, uh, does not guarantee that uh, they will be able to operate successfully in a post-US withdrawal environment, especially if the US leaves in the midst of a political, politically unsatisfactory scenario. The ANSF lacks heavy weaponry, air power, and sophisticated intelligence capability. Will they be able to operate as a cohesive force? One does not know. The economic prospects in Afghanistan are not very reassuring, despite the pledges of assistance made by Tokyo and the announced longer-term commitments made by other countries not to abandon Afghanistan. If the US exercises a zero military option, will that at all be compatible with a major long-term economic commitment, especially in a tight economic situation in the US and the Eurozone? Plans by countries to invest in Afghanistan not only depend on internal stability, but will also take some years to yield results that will make any perceptible difference on the ground. Adding to the problem is the general instability around Afghanistan. The internal situation in Pakistan is fraught despite uh, the recent elections. Iran has a new president, but the nuclear dossier remains problematic and sanctions on Iran have been further tightened. The Arab world is in turmoil with the so-called Arab Spring having withered very rapidly. Religious extremism is spreading and this gives political oxygen to such forces battling in Afghanistan. India has to cope with the situation as it develops. We have faced the worst when the Taliban took over in Afghanistan in the mid 90s. We know of course what the dangers are ahead and have to play a role in preventing untoward conditions from developing through our political and economic engagement with Afghanistan. India is pursuing, I think, a very responsible policy in Afghanistan. Uh, we want precisely what the representative Joe Crowley said just now, a sovereign, stable, democratic, and prosperous Afghanistan. One that is free from extremism and where human rights, especially those of women, are respected. India is doing nothing that is contrary to the achievement of this objective in Afghanistan. We are maintaining very friendly relations with Afghanistan based on equality and respect for their sovereignty. We are not interfering in Afghanistan's internal affairs. We are not arming any particular group or providing safe havens for terrorists or anti-government political groups to carry on violent activities against the legitimate government of Afghanistan. We have legitimate interest in Afghanistan as a neighboring country and every right to be present there. We feel that the international community should not accept the curtailment of Afghan sovereignty by endorsing the principle that the Afghan government should give precedence to the interests of any particular country over that of another. It is for the Afghan government to take independent decisions in a responsible way. India has no intention to occupy the legitimate space that other neighboring countries of Afghanistan seek there. We have established a strategic relationship with Afghanistan. This is anchored in a long-term bilateral and regional perspective. India has geopolitical strategic interests in this entire region, which forms part of our larger strategic neighborhood. Afghanistan, as you know, borders Central Asia and Iran, apart from China and Pakistan. India has had age-old ties with Afghanistan, Central Asia, and Iran, with the history of our country linked to this region over centuries. Central Asia is landlocked, and so is Afghanistan. 
the development of this region faces a particularly difficult challenge because of this. The entire region needs the broadest possible choices for its development. It is natural for it to look for enhanced ties with India as the biggest economy in Southern Asia that can substantially contribute to this objective. And we are willing to respond. Afghanistan has huge mineral resources that await exploitation. We are ready to invest large sums in this sector, beginning with iron ore extraction. Afghanistan is ready to offer us a natural resources corridor for development. For realizing this objective, India needs better access to Afghanistan. Pakistan is not as yet willing to provide transit facilities through its territory to us. Therefore, India is looking at the Chabahar port in Iran as an access route to Afghanistan, as well as Central Asia. We have recently committed dollars $100 million to this project, but US-EU sanctions on Iran are compli complicating such efforts to give Afghanistan alternative options for its trade and improve the conditions for foreign investment there. I feel the US government should take a positive view of Indian investments in Iran that are specifically directed at easing Afghanistan's difficult situation, which will be important for stimulating the Afghan economy, at present too dependent on foreign assistance and income derived from the presence of foreign troops on its soil. In developing trade and energy ties between Central Asia and the Indian subcontinent, a project that the U.S. favors as part of the new Silk Road project, Afghanistan is a critical hub. The TAPI pipeline, which will bring Turkmenistan gas to Pakistan and India through Afghanistan, is a project that we support. India can fruitfully participate in, it, in projects to increase electricity grids in the region and alleviate regional energy-related problems. India is participating in several international efforts to contribute to the economic development in Afghanistan, whether it's the Istanbul process or the Heart of Asia conferences in Kabul in June 2012 and in Istanbul in April 2013. And we took the initiative ourselves to organize a Delhi investment summit on Afghanistan also in June 2012. Um, India's own bilateral aid to Afghanistan has reached dollars to billion, as was noted earlier. Some see in this effort by us to seek undue influence in Afghanistan. If India's foreign assistance program as a whole is considered, and the billions of dollars that Indian companies are now investing abroad, this is not a very big sum. There is full participation of the Afghan authorities in selecting Indian assistance projects which are infrastructural, as well as geared to meeting the basic requirements of the people and localities spread over the country. A large number of our projects are in fact in the Pashtun areas. And India has earned great popularity because of the manner in which we have, which we have conducted ourselves. Economic development in Afghanistan and the region I think is essential to checkmate the growth of extremist ideologies in the region and associated terrorist activity. These concerns are uppermost in India's mind as we are most exposed as a country to terrorism and supporting ideologies. As a secular, multi-religious state, we are particularly sensitive to such threats. Any boost given to these extremist forces, even unwittingly, should be unacceptable as our security is threatened. It is with concern, therefore, that we view the outreach by US, Britain, and others to the Taliban. We are not against any genuine attempt at reconciliation if all sides want it on a basis that respects the red lines drawn by the international community for a dialogue with the Taliban. We find that these red lines are being blurred by NATO's anxiety to withdraw from Afghanistan by 2014, whatever the ground situation. Such a strategy gives the upper hand to the Taliban groups in Pakistan in negotiations. As they know, time is on their side. The rhetoric remains that the reconciliation process should be Afghan-led and Afghan-owned, but the manner in which the dialogue is being structured does not suggest that it will be an independent intra-Afghan process. 
President Karzai has already distanced himself from the U.S. initiative. We feel that nothing should be done behind the back of the Kabul government. Later statements from persons close to President Karzai express the deep concern of the Kabul government about understandings that the U.S. may have reached with Pakistan and the possibility of South and Eastern Afghanistan being handed over to the Taliban, which could divide the country and trigger an all-out conflict. The end game in Afghanistan is being played out in an atmosphere of great suspicion and bickering amongst the principal parties involved. The manner in which the Doha office of the Taliban was opened has made matters worse, and Lisa Curtis referred to that. The conduct of the Taliban in declaring themselves as the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, I think, made their own end game quite clear. The link between the Taliban and Pakistan is evident. One will have to wait and watch whether the declared U.S. position that no single country will be allowed to dominate post-2014 Afghanistan, something which Representative Joe Crowley also mentioned, can be sustained by it when its intention is to withdraw from Afghanistan is so clear. India has not been adequately kept in the picture about the dialogue with the Taliban, despite our vital concerns being involved. We suffered when the Taliban came to power in 1996. That was the only time India had no diplomatic relations with Afghanistan, and terrorists were being trained on its soils for attacks against India. If the Taliban were to be accommodated again, India would have reason to be concerned. Uh, we find that the policies of uh, our Western friends on Afghanistan are neither sufficiently steady nor transparent. The argument that uh, the Taliban has various currents in it and uh, there are moderate Taliban has been exposed to my mind as being hollow by what has transpired in Egypt where the same arguments distinguishing between various strands of the Muslim Brotherhood and welcoming their assumption to power have proved devoid of worth. India does not want ethnic conditions of ethnic conflict to be created again in Afghanistan. The international community must safeguard against it. The post-2014 situation in Afghanistan remains very uncertain, as the country will be faced with a political and military transition, even when the external danger to the country has not been neutralized. The root of the problem must be dealt with which is external support for Afghan extremists and their instrumentalization for achieving the military ambitions of a third country. So long as there are safe havens for extremists outside Afghanistan, the problem will not go away. If the Taliban retain influence in eastern and southern Afghanistan, as people say they do, it is because their staging grounds are outside. Uh, let me conclude very quickly because uh, I have been already signaled that the time is running out. Uh, but I'd like to say that our strategic partnership with Afghanistan is not directed against any third country. The primary element in this strategic partnership is not military. India is willing to contribute to the capacity building of the Afghan National Security Forces through training and supply of non-lethal equipment so that they can better provide security to the people after the withdrawal of foreign troops from the country. Our goals are primarily economically oriented, uh, we have no intention to supplant NATO. And finally, I'd like to make the point that uh, it is, to my mind, a perverse notion that the real problem in Afghanistan is India-Pakistan rivalry, because I find echoes of this now uh, in many circles. Uh, I think those who feel that their intervention in Afghanistan has not worked to stabilize the situation to the extent that they may have wanted, and now want to cut costs at all, uh, cut, not want to cut, cut costs, should not seek to transfer the responsibility for their failure onto India's shoulders. We were not responsible for the rise of religious terrorism in the region. We were not responsible for the civil war in Afghanistan. After the Soviet departure, we did not put the Taliban to power in Kabul. We had no presence, no hand in the presence of Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden in, in Afghanistan. We had no responsibility for U.S. NATO military intervention in Afghanistan. The Taliban groups or the Haqqani groups are not in India. NATO soldiers are, are, are being killed by groups operating from Pakistani soil, not ours. If the U.S. has had to resort to drone attacks against terrorists in Pakistan, it is not because of us. Uh, so 
uh, I will stop there, and uh, maybe in the question and answers session, one can elucidate some question marks that you may have in your mind. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Uh, uh, Dr. Kanwal Sibal, for uh, uh, bringing out uh, India's uh, position and also the offer that it's very important that the stability in the region cannot be just uh, uh, ensured by uh, one single path, but we have to have alternate paths. And India is ready to contribute. It's already contributed significantly in the economic development. India's interests are also aligned with uh, the international goals. So that's position uh, he has uh, put forward. So this will be now question and session. As you know, that uh, we had the great uh, view points presented. So the question answer session would be very brief. Uh, we would like to limit it to five so that we can start the next session on time. There would not be any break in between the sessions, uh, two sessions, uh, and then we'll have a lunch break. So now we'll start uh, questions. Anyone can uh, raise a question. The question uh, can be directed to a specific panelist or in, gen in general. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, get up and uh, it is audible. Yeah, go ahead. Ali Giovanni, question for Professor Melvin. Uh, can you speak a little bit about the Kansas index that's working? Any observations from some of the indicators? What indicators are going well? What are not going so well? What indicators appear to be going a certain way, but we need to be careful about them? Thank you, my friend. And I doubt I'll say anything too earth shattering in my answer, but I appreciate uh, your recognition of the uh, Afghanistan index that my colleague Ian Livingston worked so hard on in particular. And I think in, in broad brush, the, the, the good news on the security front is the resilience, the size, the increased uh, training and equipment, and the willingness to fight of the Afghan security forces. The bad news is the resilience of the enemy and the ongoing challenge posed by the enemy and the fact that after this great uh, surge of NATO and Afghan and other international effort militarily in the last four years, we have not meaningfully weakened the insurgency. Yes, there are places it's weaker. Yes, there are many of its leaders that have been taken down. But the overall ability of the Taliban to create violence has not been meaningfully affected. So that's the bad news. On the economic development side, again, in broad brush, we have seen as rapid of an improvement in human development indicators in Afghanistan the last dozen years as, frankly, anywhere on the planet that I'm familiar with uh, in, in the history of development. That's the good news. The bad news is it's happened in the context of pumping in so many resources that we've actually exacerbated a good deal of the corruption, and it's not clear that the institutions in Afghanistan are capable of sustaining or managing this as the international effort draws down. I'm just going to make a couple other very brief points and I'll be done. And I thought the uh, Secretary uh, comments were very, very good. I just, when he raised a couple of things, I think a very brief response is, is needed for, uh, one is I agree fully that we should not be portraying Afghanistan's current troubles as due to an Indo-Pakistani rivalry. In fact, there was a paper written at Brookings that made such an allegation and I felt the need to actually challenge my own colleague in that regard. Uh, I understood he was making other points as well. It was an intelligent paper in many respects, but it could be misinterpreted or read in a certain way as suggesting that somehow this was the new great game that India and Pakistan were equally to blame for a proxy warfare that was emerging in Afghanistan. I would just like to uh, associate myself with the view that India has not been a culprit. Having said that, I think India still needs to keep thinking hard, as it has been, about how not to do that. And there may be places where, even though India is not at fault, uh, that some degree of flexibility on its presence in Afghanistan is worth keeping in mind. For example, I don't think India should have a large bilateral military training program in Afghanistan in the future, because that would predictably exacerbate tensions. It's not, it would not be India's fault, but we know how Pakistan could easily react to that. And I, and I also think that it's best uh, that India uh, emphasize more of its efforts in the center, north, and west. Now, I don't want to, of course, that has its own dangers because then Pakistanis will say you're just helping your northern alliance friends and you don't really care about Afghanistan writ large. On the other hand, uh, if you have to balance between the concerns that uh, Pakistanis will see an Indian presence in the south and east as somehow, you know, uh, a cover for helping insurgencies within Pakistan, uh, I think we have to be sensitive to that. Again, it's not India's fault that Pakistan feels that way, and I won't get into the broader issues in the Indo-Pakistani relationship, but narrowly on this issue, um, I, I think we have to be sensitive 
to the kinds of reactions that we can engender. But I think India has done that. I, I, I'm just encouraging my friends to keep doing so. Very briefly, the zero option, as I've said before, I think is a, is a poor idea. The good news is I don't think it's a preferred option by the Obama administration. It's a little bit more of, a, of, a, of an option than I would like to see under any circumstances. And I've uh, differed with the Obama administration on this point. I don't think it should be even raised. And Lisa and I made arguments to that effect a moment ago. Uh, but I don't think you should worry too much that it's our likely preferred preference. And very finally, on the issue of the Taliban, and again, uh, the Secretary raised some uh, valid concerns here. But I do not believe that having seen more than 2,000 of its own uh, soldiers, Marines, and other personnel killed, by an enemy that is largely described and summarized as the Taliban, that we are going to be privy to encouraging a deal in which the Taliban would be allowed large swaths of southern and eastern Afghanistan. There's more we can do to assure people that we do not have any such intention. And, and, and the Afghan government will have the ultimate dec decisions here, but uh, I don't think we have any such intention. I just want to be very clear on that. Thank, thanks for clarifying. I would like to request uh, 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 Mr. Kanwar Lake uh, uh, Sivalji to uh, talk about this very briefly, though, uh, about this uh, impact of and the need of or any rationale behind this bilateral training programs that India is in, probably interested in. Well, I, I'd like to make the larger point that uh, uh, we have been particularly uh, mindful of uh, U.S. concerns and U.S. equities in Afghanistan. And that has constrained a great deal uh, of what we could have done, might have done, uh, in the face of provocations by Pakistan. Uh, but we felt that our relationship with the United States uh, was uh, much more important uh, than uh, yielding to pressure from internal lobbies uh, to react to Pakistan's provocations in Afghanistan, including the bombing of our embassy and uh, other targets related to India in, in, that, in that country. Um, the United States uh, has always been a little, uh, uh, had, had reservations about uh, India's involvement in, uh, in giving uh, military assistance uh, to the Karzai government. Uh, we ourselves are not terribly keen on uh, expanding our military role uh, in Afghanistan because we know we cannot sustain it. And uh, we don't want to get caught uh, in uh, a situation uh, where we begin the process of getting more and more involved in this and then we would not know where to stop. So what we have always considered reasonable and practical is to give training to, Pakistan, to, Afghan, um, to the Afghan military, not in Afghanistan, uh, but in India. Pakistan feels very concerned that uh, we are giving training to the Afghan uh, military personnel and they have been asking Karzai to send uh, Afghan military personnel to Pakistan for their training. We've never told the Kabul government don't do that. But Karzai has not wanted uh, to send them and Afghan military officers themselves have not wanted to go to Afghanistan because they don't want to be tainted with the brush of having become IS ISI potential recruits. Uh, for, uh, for Pakistan and Afghanistan. So that's, that's not our problem. Um, insofar as um, uh, the numbers are concerned of uh, people we are training, they remain very modest. Uh, we're not giving any lethal combat equipment, uh, et cetera, et cetera. With regard to uh, our presence in uh, Pashtun areas, let me make the point which is not sufficiently made, that our historical ties with Afghanistan have not been beyond the Hindu Kush. They've always been in the Pashtun areas. Um, and there are a lot of, uh, lot of commonalities between uh, Northwestern India and the, and the, and the Pashtun areas. Uh, I remember when I, I was in power and we had, uh, when I was in, in office and we had uh, uh, the marshes made to us uh, from the Pashtuns that they wanted to revive. Uh, the trade in dry fruits and fruits uh, from, uh, from Afghanistan uh, uh, to India, uh, etc. I said they wanted us to reduce duties, everything else. We did. And now there's very considerable f and flourishing trade in dry fruits and fruits from Afghanistan, from the Pashtun areas to India. We've always had our consulates in, uh, in the Pashtun areas, in Kandahar and in, 
in uh, Jalalabad. It was only interrupted when the Taliban were in power. So when the Taliban uh, were removed from power, these consulates uh, were reinstated. So to suggest that we are there or we came there to create problems uh, for Pakistan is very, uh, is very unfair. And finally, I'd like to make the point that if Pakistan feels that uh, we should limit our presence in uh, the southern and eastern part of Afghanistan and that we should limit our military role there, then I'd like to raise the question of uh, Pakistan's military involvement in Sri Lanka. Uh, they are providing arms uh, to Sri Lanka. The Pakistani army chiefs have been going to Sri Lanka. The Sri Lankan army chiefs have been visiting uh, Pakistan. Uh, it's a very sensitive issue for us because they, are, they have been bolstering the capacity of the Sri Lankan government uh, to uh, deal with the Tamilians and eventually they succeeded in, uh, in, uh, up, in, in destroying the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the LTTE, something which we supported. But we have never raised this issue that, that, that it's illegitimate for Pakistan to have a military presence in, in, uh, in, 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 in Sri Lanka. Pakistan has a huge embassy in Nepal, huge embassy in Nepal, which has been used as, from your reports, you will see they've been used it as a conduit for sending in uh, uh, terrorists as well as uh, uh, fake currency into India. This is one of the principal routes. We've not made a big issue of that because that's our problem with Nepal. We have to deal with it. So I, I think we should not pander to these uh, demands by Pakistan that they have some kind of uh, legitimate oversight over the uh, decisions of third countries in Afghanistan. Uh, it is for the Afghanistan government to decide. And it is a failure of Pakistan diplomacy if they cannot persuade the Karzai government and the Afghan government to have good relations with them. It's not our fault. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kanwal. So last question we'll take, uh, and probably if you could direct to Lisa, that would be great. Uh, one of the questions, yeah. Yeah, uh, Lisa, you, you, you talked about this zero option that has been considered since the Taliban opened an office in Qatar, but in January, the White House officials were talking about zero options, so it's not related to the plunder in Qatar. Don't you think it appears to be deep in the policies of this administration? And a short question to Secretary uh, Sibal uh, on this military assistance that President Karzai requested a while ago from India. It appears to be turned down by New Delhi. If you have any insights on that to share with us. Just real quick on the other point, I just wanted to put in my two cents that um, I, I agree with uh, much of what uh, Conwell Sibyl has said. And, you know, I was in the U.S. administration uh, shortly after 9-11 when this issue came up about the U.S. asking India to, to close down its consulate in Jalalabad and, and, you know, just very taken aback by this uh, entire idea. Because to me, it's foreign policy 101 you don't ask the country that actually supports your interest uh, to, to draw back its influence in order to placate the other country that's directly undermining your uh, goals in the region. So th this does not make sense, uh, I believe. And so I, I agree with uh, Conwell Sibyl's remarks on that. Um, and getting to your point about the issue of zero troops being an option on the table even before the uh, Doha office. I, I agree. There are probably uh, some in the White House who, from a political perspective, uh, maybe not understanding the importance of Afghanistan, who, who may just want to pull out altogether from Afghanistan. I, I hope that Michael is right, that that's not the preponderant view in the White House, that there is m you know, more of an understanding of the need to keep U.S. troops there after 2014. But I'm sure there, there are some in the White House who, who would argue in this favor, and basically, what I was saying is that when the uh, when Karzai was frustrated with how the U.S. handled the opening of the Doha office, pulled out of the bilateral sec security agreement talks, I think there was a, a lot of frustration among U.S. officials, and so then they were willing to be more publicly open about the zero option being on the table simply because they were frustrated with Karzai. And as both Michael and I pointed out, this, this is really not a sound policy. Uh, if you're thinking about what is in the U.S. national security interest, you know, having zero troops in Afghanistan clearly is not in our interest. So it was, it was short-sighted, I think, of the White House to 
let the zero option get out there merely to try to put pressure on Karzai, and we both argued this wouldn't work in any case. So not, not a very good strategy, in my opinion. Very briefly, I, in my prepared uh, remarks, uh, I wanted to emphasize that uh, our primary uh, goal in Afghanistan is economically oriented. It's not military oriented. Because if you, go, if you have to have a credible Central Asian policy, uh, and this region is very vital uh, for us, even in the context of the growth of Islamist uh, ideologies, uh, we have to be uh, in Afghanistan. If, we don't, if we're not present in Afghanistan, we can't have a Central Asian policy. So we are looking at this in a longer term integrated uh, way of uh, how we can play a role in this region, especially an economic role, number one. Uh, number two, we have had a long-standing policy of not s supplying arms to countries which are in the midst of a civil war or in the midst of a conflict situation, uh, which is why, for example, in Sri Lanka, uh, we've been very, very careful in terms of uh, uh, giving any arms support. Uh, in Afghanistan, it's a clear situ conflict situation, and therefore we're not interested uh, as a policy uh, issue, it is not possible for us unless we change our formal policy in this regard. Number three, President Karzai would like very much India to bolster uh, Afghanistan by increasing our commitment to Afghanistan through uh, greater um, uh, arms relationship uh, with, uh, with Afghanistan. But that may be Karzai's way of thinking, but that's not necessarily what our policy is, and therefore we've been reticent. But in terms of training, we have, uh, in fact, augment, uh, increased the numbers of uh, trainees in India. Uh, and then when it comes to, let's say, spare parts for the helicopters or things like that, uh, the Russians are doing that, as you know, in, in understanding with NATO. So we don't have much of a, much of a uh, ro role there. And let me finally say that with regard to concerns about uh, uh, the Taliban being offered uh, southern and eastern parts of Afghanistan as a price for their cooperation uh, to allow the NATO troops to, to withdraw honorably. The British roadmap is very clear on this. They have advocated uh, uh, that this should be done uh, and also that uh, they should, the Taliban should be accommodated in the central government and also should be given a certain number of governorships and all this without any democratic electoral exercise. I'm glad that the United States has reticence uh, about these plans, but uh, since Britain is, is a major player in Afghanistan and does concert with the United States side on policy matters, one hopes that uh, British thinking will not uh, succeed in persuading <laughs> the American side that this might be the best option in terms of uh, withdrawing on honorably from Afghanistan. So thanks, Colonel Ji. Uh, uh, generally, I would have asked uh, Michael to respond, but uh, we have such a short of time, so I apologize. <laughs> so I apologize for that. And thanks, everybody. This is a, has been a very great uh, panel, and I wish we had uh, longer time, so that would have been much more enriching, and you would have had opportunity to ask more questions. But I assure you, uh, assure you that the rest of the panels are also uh, very great. And over, uh, during the, uh, the whole day, you will definitely get more insight and more opportunity to participate. Once again, thanks, uh, Michael, Lisa, and uh, Kanwalji to uh, grace this panel. Thank you, Mr. Kandirao, and uh, thanks. I, as he said, uh, we've had a great panel, and uh, obviously could have had a Q&A for a couple more hours, but <clears throat> lucky for you, some of our speakers are still here, so you can hopefully have an engagement with them. <clears throat> now we come to the keynote part of our um, panel, and um, we're going to move things around a little bit. Um, I know we have um, really some esteemed speakers here, so I'll ask uh, our speakers to come and take a seat. Uh, Mr. Singh, uh, why don't you come and uh, take a seat here? And uh, uh, Deputy Chief of Mission. Uh, because of the tightness of time, I think we will um, get started uh, with our dialogue and our conversation. Um, and you know, the focus obviously has been on Afghanistan and what happens um, uh, post uh, withdrawal of 2014. Um, you know, somebody, uh, one of our speakers probably has 
a lot to say about this because he deals with this uh, probably on a daily basis. And that's the Deputy Chief of Mission, uh, Mr. Ashraf Haidari from uh, the Embassy of Afghanistan in New Delhi. And we are really thrilled to have him with us uh, because um, you know he has a unique perspective uh, from Afghanistan also serving in India uh, and also being part of the region. So we are really lucky to have him. He's served in Washington, D.C. also uh, as a, uh, various capacities at Charge Affairs and Deputy Chief of Mission and also the first Secretary of uh, Political Security and Development Affairs. And uh, he's born in Afghanistan, and obviously he shares a story that resonates with most uh, Afghans during the occupation. Uh, he's from Kabul, so we'd love to welcome him and have him talk about what he sees the role of the region as we move forward. And then we'll have our other speakers come in. Uh, Mr. Zaidari, please. Um, the Honorable uh, Members of Congress, Excellencies, Distinguished Scholars, Ladies and Gentlemen, please allow me to begin by thanking the co-organizers of this timely conference, including the U.S.-India Political Action Committee, the American Foreign Policy Council, and the Foundation of India and Indian Diaspora Studies. In fact, I've been on a private visit to the U.S and did not come to Washington for this purpose. <laughs> but my special thanks to the chairman, uh, Mr. Sanjay Puri, who kindly extended to me an invitation to speak today. I gladly accepted to do so on a short notice, given the importance of our um, enduring strategic partnership with India and the United States. Of course, I'm deeply honored to share this podium with members of the United States Congress, BGP President, the Honorable Rajnet Singh Ji, as well as other distinguished speakers from the US and India. Ladies and gentlemen, an increasingly interdependent, interconnected, and shrinking world, security and stability in one country depends on the security and the stability of the rest. This is especially the case with landlocked countries, whose stability and sustainable development squarely depend on enable, an enabling regional environment. Afghanistan is a landlocked country and heavily relies on regional cooperation from economic to political and security sectors in order to realize and develop on a sustainable basis. However, as we recall from the history of Afghanistan, especially recent history of Afghanistan, regional and international actors have not always been kind to us, indeed at their own peril on the long run. During the Cold War, Afghanistan was compelled to side with the West, led by the United States, and together we ended the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan and subsequently toppled the communist regime which the former Soviet Union supported. After this victory, the Afghan people rightfully expected the international community and the United States in particular to help stabilize and rebuild our country so that peace, freedom, democracy, pluralism could gradually take root and become institutionalized in Afghanistan. On the contrary, however, soon after the fall of the communist regime following the withdrawal of these defeated Soviet forces from Afghanistan, the post-war reconstruction and the stabilization of our country were completely neglected. Morally speaking, we were not rewarded for the destruction of our country, the killing of two, over two million Afghans, and the displacement of over five million others, all caused by a Cold War proxy conflict that we fought on behalf of the West. As the world disengaged from Afghanistan prematurely, our state institutions began failing, our politics became factionalized, and our country turned into a no man's land, serving as a battlefield for regional proxy conflicts. This subsequently allowed Pakistan to create and launch a paramilitary force labeled as Taliban to invade and occupy Afghanistan. And over time, as we recall, the Taliban invited and sheltered the leader of Al-Qaeda, Osama bin Laden, in Afghanistan, from where he and his transnational network 
comfortably masterminded and executed the tragedy of 9-11. Ladies and gentlemen, anyone who visited Afghanistan under the Taliban 12 years ago and has visited the country since would tell you about the fundamental ways in which Afghanistan has been transformed. Our monumental achievements of the past 12 years result from the sacrifices of many nations in Afghanistan. And we remain indebted to each of the 48 nations which have been providing us with moral and material support over the past decade. Foremost, we're grateful to the United States people and government for their continued support as they have stood by us every step of the way to get where we are today. We honor the ultimate sacrifice of more than 3,000 American forces who bravely fought alongside their Afghan comrades to help provide an enabling, secure environment for an institutionalization of peace and democracy in Afghanistan. I want their families and their representatives in the United States Congress to know that these forces' ultimate sacrifices have not gone in vain, but have changed forever the lives of millions of Afghans across our country. At the same time, we're grateful to the Indian people and government for sharing their bread with us over the past 12 years. India's generous assistance is complementing the aid provided by the U.S. and other, other countries in building an institutional capacity in our government, rebuilding our critical infrastructure, and connecting Afghanistan commercially with the rest of the region. As a result of combined international aid over the past 12 years, 10.5 million Afghans are enrolled in the schools across Afghanistan. Each year, more than 150,000 students graduate to pursue higher education in Afghanistan and abroad, including India, where we have nearly 10,000 students pursuing degrees in different fields. Our per capita GDP of $591 in 2011 is five times higher than $123 per capita of GDP of 10 years ago. Nearly 8,000 kilometers of national highways, regional highways, um, and provincial roads have been built, cutting travel time by 75%. Moreover, civil aviation has improved, connecting Afghanistan with major regional hub. Access to electricity has increased by 250%, while some 18 million Afghans have mobile phones. Collectively, this has helped us maintain a 10% growth rate creating many jobs that never existed in the Afghan history. And democracy is flourishing. We have the freest, the freest, even not self-censored, media in the region, something that doesn't exist even in the developed countries, probably even here in the United States. And one of the most progressive constitutions in the region, allowing 27% of women to serve as MPs in the parliament. At the same time, Afghanistan civil society is growing more and more vibrant, frequently challenging the government and holding it to account. Ladies and gentlemen, these and many of our other achievements are naturally a work in progress, and keep that in mind, a work in progress. To ensure their consolidation and to sustainable gains, we have signed a number of strategic partnership agreements with our allies in the region and beyond. These agreements build on the objectives of the Istanbul, Bonn, Chicago and Tokyo Conference of Honest, uh, on Afghanistan, helping us transition towards self-reliance in the post-2014 period into a decade of transformation. The U.S. and India are two of our major strategic allies, and the agreements we have signed with them provide for their continued support to Afghanistan beyond 2014, and an effort to work together towards our common objectives to help stabilize and rebuild Afghanistan, our two countries, I've established a trilateral strategic dialogue, which has met two eyes so far. But the mechanism remains underutilized, which must be reinvigorated and used to ensure strategic coordination of the U.S. and Indian aid efforts in support of Afghanistan now and beyond 2014. Ladies and gentlemen, as we consolidate our gains of the past 12 years with continued international support, we've increasingly taken over from our allies, the task that any sovereign country should execute on its own. Last June, the Afghan National Security Forces took over from the NATO International Security Assistance Force, 
the complete leadership and ownership of all military operations across Afghanistan. And our forces are now providing protection for the all Afghan population, while NATO ISAF has begun its new mission of advising, training, and equipping the Afghan forces. And in spite of the ongoing success of the Afghan national security forces against the enemy, our forces are yet to be fully independently operational. We continue to lack an air force, and that is such critical enablers as artillery, armored mobility, reconnaissance and intelligence capabilities, close air support capabilities, airlift and evacuation capabilities, as well as logistics and maintenance mechanisms that constitute the backbone of any force. To help address these needs, we're going to sign a bilateral security agreement with the United States. At the same time, we've provided India with a list of needs to assess Afghanistan with. We believe that India can fill some of the training and equipping gaps in the Afghan National Security Forces. And the Indian government has responded positively to our request for enhanced defense cooperation based on the Afghanistan-India Strategic Partnership Agreement. Parallel to the security transition, the Afghan government has striven to ensure the, successes, the success of our political transition through implementation of a legitimate fair and transparent presidential election next year on April 5th. As President Karzai has said many times, a second and last term under the Constitution is going to come to an end, and rumors that he would remain in office is baseless. In fact, the President signed into law two critical electoral reforms this past week, paving the way for the peaceful and democratic transfer of power to the next President. At the same time, despite the way they Taliban office was open in Doha, Qatar, as most of you recall. We remain committed to ending the war in Afghanistan that would result in further strengthening of our sovereignty and territorial integrity. That's the basic expectation of the Afghan people. The victims of more than three decades of war who continue to fight and die day after day, year after year, to ensure the absolute freedom and the independence of our country. Nothing less. With that basic fact firmly in mind, the Afghan government and people are cautiously seeking a negotiated settlement with the armed opposition, including the Taliban. And that means an Afghan-led, an Afghan-owned, and an Afghan-controlled peace process where only Afghans talk to Afghans, with non-Afghans only facilitating the process at the, request, at the request of the Afghan government. Ladies and gentlemen, the new democratically elected government of Pakistan under His Excellency Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif has taken initial bold steps towards honest cooperation with Afghanistan and India. The Afghan people and government welcome with great optimism the Prime Minister's call for a new policy that sees the end of interference in the Afghan affairs now and beyond 2014. To that end, this past Sunday, his Excellency Sartaj Aziz, advisor to the Prime Minister of National Security and Foreign Affairs, visited Kabul and delivered an invitation from the Prime Minister to His Excellency President Karzai to visit Pakistan. The President accepted the invitation in principle to visit Pakistan, but asked that a substantive agenda with the specific objectives on supporting the peace process and effectively fighting terrorism be prepared before the visit could take place. Our Foreign Minister, His Excellency Dr. Zahmeh Rasul, also met with Mr. Aziz and expressed our hope to make considerable progress with Pakistan's new government in all areas, including in the fight against terrorism and extremism and the networks and systems supporting them. Mr. Aziz offered to use his country's influence and contacts with the Taliban in support of the Afghan-led and Afghan-owned peace process. This is a welcome offer of assistance, which Afghanistan had been seeking. The two sides also emphasized the importance of expanding bilateral trade, transit trade following a meeting of the coordinating authority to address issues related to the Afghanistan and Pakistan trade and transit agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, Afghanistan's number one challenge is insecurity with external roots, which exploits our numerous vulnerabilities, including ethnic diversity, widespread poverty, and weak state institutions. The externality of insecurity can also spoil the peace process in Afghanistan and impede our progress into a decade of transformation beyond 2014. 
That's why we welcome regional efforts with a strong proactive participation of India to address the shared challenge facing Afghanistan and all region. India should play a leading role in regional processes, as well as reaching a consensus with Russia and China to work out a regional roadmap for the stabilization and reconstruction of Afghanistan, where our sovereignty and territorial integrity are ensured, thereby allowing the three countries and the region to invest in Afghanistan and to prevent destructive interference in Afghan affairs. At the same time, we renew our call on the international community to stay the course in Afghanistan. Our gains of the past 12 years should be consolidated through implementation of win-win objectives, which have been out outlined in the Bonn, Chicago, and Tokyo conferences, as well as through regional initiatives such as the Istanbul process. Indeed, winning or losing in Afghanistan squarely depends on whether our allies or friends would actually deliver on the commitments they have made in these conferences and their routine interactions with the Afghan government. We hope they would do so for the reasons which I would explain briefly. The implications of winning are clear. A sovereign Afghanistan, at peace internally, and at peace with others, focus on win-win objectives towards a region where every nation would be secure and prosper through economic cooperation. This is the world in which we live today, a world which is increasingly interdependent and where zero-sum designs have proven a failure and a disaster. Sincere, results-oriented cooperation is the call of our peoples in the region and beyond. And Afghanistan stands ready to do our part for the good of all. By contrast, however, the implication of losing what is a winnable war for peace and justice are also clear in, in Afghanistan. Any shortcut to peace leads to failure. Such half-measure peace initiatives were tried to engage the Taliban in the 1990s with disastrous consequences. Let's remember that the Taliban of today are the same dark forces that brutally terrorized the Afghan people, systematically destroyed our cultural heritage sites, and forced a gender apartheid of unspeakable cruelty, and sheltered and aided Al-Qaeda to plot and execute from the Afghan soil the tragedy of 9-11. Morally speaking, any attempt to sideline Afghans and undermine their democratic gains of the past 12 years would not only destabilize the region, but irresponsibly endanger international peace and security again. Thank you very much. I took more time than I was uh, provided. I look forward to your questions.